get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise <laughs> Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I want to thank Dan Cushell for introducing me to today's phenomenal guest. Today we have Dr. Jeff Spencer, founder of the Champions Blueprint. Dr. Spencer is a former Olympian, and over the last 40 years, he has worked. You don't look that old. He last 40 years, he's worked alongside some of our generation's greatest achievers, Sir Richard Branson, Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong, U2, Olympic gold medalist, just to name a few. And it's not often I feature a fellow chiropractor as well. People call him the corner man to world champion athletes and business leaders. Dr. Spencer, thanks for joining me. Well, it's just a pleasure. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Just uh, really just so grateful to be here. Me too. I, you know, I'm really excited to have you on for a number of reasons. And okay. I watched almost all of the interviews you've done. And um, so I asked you, what's something most people know about you? And you said you were a nationally known glass sculptor. That's correct. Yeah, How did that eight... come about? What's your favorite piece of work? Well, when I was 18, uh, I was you know, a pretty good football player in high school. And um, there was a gentleman in our neighborhood that was showing a film that he filmed and edited on a gentleman named John Burton that actually won an Emmy. And he asked me if I'd like to see it. So I went inside as they were showing it to the neighborhood. And in the middle of the film there, the featured uh, person, John Burton, who was the guy that developed this class technique, said that I hadn't met someone yet that I felt that I could pass my techniques on to. Hmm. And I, I knew at that moment, that I was the guy <laughs> and I didn't know why. I mean, I come from an artistic background, but that's how that got started. And so eventually over the next, uh, you know, 20, 25 years, I developed my skill and hmm. showed uh, and ultimately ended up showing in the best galleries in New York city and showed with the best artists in the world as far as glass sculpture goes. So, so uh, what's your favorite piece that you've created? Uh, the next one I'm going to do, I the guess. Next one. Uh, yeah, it's going to be the next one, but I, I think they all have themes. They're all, very much kind of born out of my path and my journey to understand achievement and collaboration. And that's a central theme that uh, uh, probably one of my most favorite was uh, called Emerging Artists. And I actually had this big glass egg that was blown and I mm. hand sculpted these figures. Wow. And these uh, this big egg that was maybe 18 inches wide by 17 inches tall sat in this giant egg cup. It was like 45 inches tall. And then there were these 12 inch figures that were climbing out of the egg and I call that emerging artists, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a clever, you know, title to um, an important uh, work that was uh, characteristic of a particular series that I did that all involved egg themes. Yeah, and it's amazing because we were talking before we started about what do we want to make sure we cover and what seems to be amazing, we'll get into your story of just training relentlessly, Olympian, working with athletes, you know, achieving some of the pinnacles. And, and then you talk about, you know, being a nationally known glass sculptor. So it doesn't end there. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about the achievement model. And we were talking about the whole achievement model is wrong. Talk about that. Yeah, it really is. You know, one of, one of my uh, questions when I was a kid growing up, you know, I was just had Olympics on the brain. I thought the coolest thing ever would be an Olympian when I was even six or seven years old. So I noticed something odd is that the biggest and the baddest people didn't win Olympic gold medals, but the ones that did, they showed up with a certain level of readiness, and they were almost casual about it, almost as if they'd won before they even started. So I took note of that, and I didn't quite understand it. But uh, you know, I I did also notice that uh, there was a rhythm and a purposefulness behind that where it could not be an accident. And then uh, my father, uh, who is an artistic genius. Um, uh, last time I saw him when I was 13 after I won my first national cycling championship and he died homeless on the streets of New York City. I found out 30 years later. So another part of the puzzle was, okay, well, he had will, he had talent, he had technique, and he had technology. It was unrivaled, but yet he died homeless. So what's wrong with this picture? I thought that was supposed to deliver. Right. And it obviously didn't. So I had really good mentors in my life that showed me their secrets on 
how they became iconic, and I saw the pattern again. They didn't have the best pedigrees, but they were always first in line to grab the brass ring and avoid the potholes. And I, I, I saw as I contemplated this unique ability to achieve that wasn't an accident. It was very purposeful, but people of very high potential weren't producing and living a life consistent with what their abilities were. Yeah. And I realized that the model was wrong, meaning that um, the gap model, meaning that you, you dream and you have a big goal, right, which we're told to dream really big, right. and we're told to work really hard, and if you have a big enough goal and you work hard enough, you're going to close the gap to where you want to go. Right. That's a great idea, but it doesn't work. Most people try really hard. They don't go anywhere. Yeah. So I realized that this was a complete myth, and I wasn't sure exactly what it was, but then through just introspection and contemplation about this, I saw that the model was wrong. It's like the gap isn't a gap. A gap is not a void. It's not an empty space. But, but what it is, the gap is actually life. And life itself just creates resistance. I mean, I think all of us get up and we wonder, I know I was in motion for eight hours a day. How come I didn't move one inch forward, but yet I was in motion right. for eight hours? You know, we scratch our head in bewilderment about that. So I realized that really the model of working hard to get to where you want to go, it doesn't work because the gap is a resistance. And unless you can have a model that overcomes the resistance, then you can't execute your plan and you can't move forward. So I, I developed a program and a model called the Champions Blueprint where it, it looks at identifying the resistance in our life as predictable patterns that we can see actually coming on the horizon that history has revealed to us. Mm -hmm. And if we can locate kind of where you are in your life process, then we can make a determination about what are the most likely patterns that are part of our human nature response to life that's going to take us out of the game. Yeah. It's got kind of like nothing to do with the plan. But it's got everything to do with whether or not you can execute it. Yeah. And so I realized that for every pattern that we were able to observe that history has shown us that if you follow this trajectory, you're going to fail. You may not think it. And your, history, your human nature may think that this is going to succeed. History tells us that it clearly isn't. So if we can identify the patterns, there are also corresponding principles that when applied to the pattern, it neutralizes the pattern that takes us out of the game. It allows us to move through from where we are to where we want to go to consistently become a serial success. Yeah. So that's the, the program that I've created called the Champions Blueprint that gives us some amazing control over creating a life where we're actually living into our potential. Yeah. Because it's not about working harder. It's about removing the resistance so the natural momentum can carry itself to goal completion. Yeah. Yeah, and Dr. Spencer, I want to go into some of the, the champion blueprint and some of your background, and I even want to go back to when you were young and what pushes you. But but on that point, um, what's an example of something where, like you were saying, I think is really interesting about people think if they continue on this path, it's going to lead to success, right. but it's not. Correct. What What is one of those examples where people, you know, if we kind of demystify that for a second, sure. that people are probably thinking right now, I don't do that. I have the right mindset. So what's one of those examples that would uh, shock people a little bit? Well, I, I think I just gave it. It's like we think that if we work harder and we want it bad enough, we're going to achieve. And that, mm -hmm. that clearly is not true. I mean, it sounds good. See, we all have a human nature. And our human nature is a certain intelligence that we're born with that makes sense out of certain things. And mm -hmm. it's driven in certain ways to complete things. I mean, it's like how many times have you had a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you're on cloud nine, and then you wake up, you know, a week later, and you say, "What was I thinking?" Well, you know, this large was, divorce rate. So I'm sure that happens yeah, that, a lot. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. So it's like it seems so right to us, correct? Mm -hmm. But it delivered so wrong. It's a perfect example. Another example. Let's say you have a sports person whose performance starts to decline over time. Right. So they say, "Well, I'm not training hard enough." That's the problem. So they go out and they train harder, and they actually go worse. They get sick or they get injured. It's because they misinterpreted it. It yeah. wasn't they were training. Uh, not enough. It's they were training too hard, so they were overtrained. That's why they had a loss of performance. Mm -hmm. So again, kind of our human nature's uh, interpretation of circumstances is oftentimes wrong, and history has proven that it's wrong. But we just can't believe it is until we fail. Yeah. And so those are two, I think, very obvious. Another thing is that you know, if I get a good college education, I'm going to get a great job. Right. Yeah, it sounds good, but you know, again, it's not a guarantee of anything. Right. 
So we have this sort of mythical world that we live in where if we do this, we should go here. But history tells us if we do this, this is where we're headed. Yeah. You, may, you may not think it. For example, today in today's culture, there's a lot of things being tried in our country right now that have been tried in ancient Egypt, and it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. Right. But somehow we think that it is. You know, but but it's not because history has already told us what the outcome is, and, and history doesn't lie. Yeah. So, I like that. You know, I want to stick with the working harder because that is a mentality that's really common that we could just push through if we work harder. So, what's a solution for that that people should think about? Obviously, one of the things is get the Champions Blueprint, but within the Champions Blueprint, what what's a solution for that? What should people to get out of that thinking? Well, you know, number one. Uh, the trying harder to get to where you want to go, it, do, it doesn't work. You can't mow anything. You can't mow everything down. The reality of it is, is that if you don't have a good plan and you don't have the skills, then you're not going to get anywhere. Right. So you need to develop the skills that are required to execute the steps of the plan to be able to carry momentum forward. But you also need the skills to eliminate the anticipated resistance that will basically keep you stuck mm -hmm. and so there it would be a matter of getting it well at least for me you know the champion blueprint is that the antidote for that because I've, I've cracked the code on it right. but just to say that if you want to try to do it on your own without the blueprint then you find somebody that's kind of done what you aspire to do and you look at the model and you figure out what are the challenges and what are the things that you did right yeah so you have some empirical evidence historically based that serves as a predictable guideline that's just different than what you think it is yeah. because it may not be what you think it is. So that's first and foremost. Don't try to reinvent something. Look for someone that's already done it and look at what they've done right and look at what they've done wrong. You know, looking at probably looking at the, what they've done wrong probably is the place to start right. because generally everybody pretty much thinks the same way. Oh, yeah, the universe is going to fill in the gaps. If I just get started, then everything I need is going to show up. It's a great idea, but no responsible performer in any domain that is prolific ever thinks like that right right great idea but it doesn't deliver yeah we'll go through some of the champions blueprint uh lessons but i'm just so curious of what pushed you from an early age you know when i was reading i was reading at age nine you were waking up at 4 30 a.m practicing <laughs> what yeah. were you thinking then what was pushing you i just thought that the world was just an amazing uh you know sandbox that wanted to be explored and i just had a natural curiosity and I had a natural motivation too. So I get up in the morning, 4.30, I go outside with my little baseball and my baseball bat. I hit the ball up and down the street by myself yeah. while everybody else was sleeping. And I just think about, wow, you know, how do Olympians win? You know, how do I get better at this? I, gosh, I wonder what happens if I do that. So I had a, a natural curiosity. And because I came from a, you know, a, a welfare family, there wasn't a lot of parental involvement. So I didn't get taught, no, or don't do this or do that. You know, I kind of had freedom to explore everything, you know, and th there were some downsides to that, of course, but, you know, the point is, is that I just had a natural curiosity, and I've always been curious about why is it there are people that can and do, and why is yeah. it there are people that can and don't. I've always had that natural curiosity. It is amazing. Like, I'm just so curious. What gave you that discipline at that age? I mean, it was just inborn in you? You think just... you? I, I, don't, I, mean, I, I don't know if you're born with it. I, yeah. I think... You know, we're, 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 we're born with an innate inclination to make a lot of mistakes and to want to try to do it our own way and believing the myths of trying harder. I think that's the way that we're born, yeah. you know, but we, but we need to ask deeper questions is about why is it that people try all these things are living only half of their potential? Why can't they go the distance with that? Yeah. So it's like I think I developed that because I was around people that had initiative I was around people that were encouraging to me. I didn't really know what the word can't meant because I nobody I never had anybody tell me that I couldn't. And so I, I think those were important elements, being around people that are vital, they're enthusiastic, they're encouraging, they're accomplished themselves. And uh, it's really a, being around an environment that, that, that really calls you to a higher level of participation in life itself. Yeah. So who were some of your early mentors that influenced you? Uh, well, you know, certainly there were older kids in the neighborhood because I was in an odd age. I was kind of uh, five years younger than one group and five years older than another. So the older guys kind of adopted me into their group. And I just had an amazing athletic ability. And, you know, I remember going on a 25-mile bike ride, my first bike ride with these guys that were six years older. 
And at the end of the ride, I wasn't tired, and they were. And so I kind of realized at that point there was something different about me right. you know, in the sports domain. But I would also say my cycling coach, you know, I started cycling when I was 10. He was an amazing mentor. He's a wonderful human being that really understood development as an individual first and as an athlete second. And let's make sure that you get good technically first before you try harder. I mean, he taught me some amazing things that, that, that really made the difference that ultimately led to me becoming an Olympian, actually, which I owe him a debt of gratitude for sure. So what were some of the lessons he taught you mentally? Because it sounded like physically you just, at that point, had a natural ability, but it's your work ethic and your kind of your mental, your mentality behind it. Yeah, well, I did, but it's like, you know, too much push can also equal illness or injury. Yeah. So he taught me too much push doesn't make you better. You know, he really taught me that, you know, purposeful pause associated with the effort gives your body a chance to rebuild back to a higher level. And if you don't respect that, then prepare to get sick or injured. You know, he also taught me that um, you need to show restraint in when you do and you do not push. He also taught me that you never engage your opponent's uh, making it a, a, a personal issue. You always make it competitive so you don't get, you know, drawn into their playing field and you lose your competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, you know, taught me uh, how to put out 100%. Most people don't know how to do that. You know, when they get to a point where it starts to hurt, they back off, you know. And so he taught me how to push into that rarefied era of the 5% that most people can't get to that you have to train yourself to go into because it could be exertionally painful to go there. Yeah, yeah. But it's the only way you're going to ever excel, and it's not something to be feared. It's something to be uh, learned and, and learned to be transcendent of by knowing how to show up and knowing how to transcend it. Yeah, so Dr. Spencer, on that, what is going through your mind when you are feeling that pain, you're feeling that hurt, and you know you just have to push through? Well, only because you know that's the difference. You know, everything else being equal is the person that can stay in the game longer is the one that's going to win. Yeah. You know, in, in, I mean, anybody can do or anything. You know, it's just that our mind gives up before our body does. So mm -hmm. we just need to, you have to really push beyond the finish line in a certain sense. So it's like if you, if you look at the 100 meter dash in the Olympics, they always pull up short when they do it in slow motion. So you got to run, learn to run three steps beyond so that you carry maximum speed through the finish because, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking literally in terms of, hundreds of seconds to win and that may be the difference between a burnt cake and a cake that wins the prize for the best cake right the analogy holds true in business sport right. and life you know on in stage itself yeah. so you know to me that's a, a major key yeah i'm just wondering what's going through your mind are you thinking this is where champions are made are there certain words that go through your mind or no, no. You, know, you have a target that you push to at least in that instance which is beyond the finish line because you know you're going to let up before the finish line. Everybody does. They've already decided what it is mm -hmm. before they get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and you never make that decision. You know, it's only over when you pass over it. So, you know, if you're side by side with somebody, you have to push beyond that to find that extra dimension within yourself, and you got to be willing to risk everything to get there. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it's like it, there's nothing that can hurt you so bad that it's going to kill you. I mean, really, yeah. it's it's really a perceived fear that's not real. But you have to go there and experience it to realize that it, it's, it's a myth. Mm -hmm. So at age 21, you became an yeah. Olympian. Tell yeah. me about, this was in 1972 Olympics, right? Yes, yeah. So tell me about the Olympics. Well, it was an amazing thing. I mean, to get there was uh, an amazing ordeal itself. You know, people say, well, wasn't it a sacrifice to get there? I said, well, no, isn't it a sacrifice not to do what you can potentially do? I always feel that people that don't yeah. do anything, that's where the sacrifice is. So that was kind of like easy. I was lucky to have good people help me out financially and tactically to develop the skill to be able to make the Olympic team. And uh, the Olympic team at that time was funded by the contributions of American people. So uh, it was a great honor to represent them in the Olympics. Uh, you know, it was also the Olympics where the Arab terrorists killed a bunch of Israelis. Right. And I, I realized that, you know, um, there's evil out there in the world. And, uh, you know, evil will not, will go to any extent to make their cause be known, and uh, to me that was shocking, it was uh, inexcusable, but it did teach me about something about the world that we live in, and uh, that was that was tough. I had nine family members freaking murdered, you know, mm -hmm. and I was literally a hundred yards from where it happened. Really? Yeah, wow. and so, you know, all I can say is that, you know, 
to live a life of safety, you, you have to take action to make sure that you create and preserve your safety. And you create a sandbox that you want to play in. And don't leave it up to other people to do it, you know? And prepare to be criticized if you take an early stand. Because you may have to take a stand before other people recognize that, you know, there's, there's a risk here. Um, I also learned in the Olympics what it meant to really be one people in a sense that, you know, we always talk about this world harmony and stuff. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have a pretty good track record of that. And so I remember they had, they had a theater in the Olympic Village uh, where I went. I went into it and all the athletes from all over the world were there in their sweatsuits. And um, everybody was laughing and it was a packed theater. And yet it was uh, Charlie Chaplin's masterpiece, Modern Times, it was playing. Mm. And it was like a universal language that allowed us all to participate on a common ground. Where I, I would say that for the first, you know, and perhaps only time I've ever been in a place where everybody was in complete harmony, you know, with each other. So I, I know that it's possible, but to get there, it takes an extraordinary uh, uh, person uh, and a, you know, particularly extraordinary environment, you know, to be able to make that happen. And I think that everybody should, you know, part of my Olympic experience was that I had the chance, but I, I think I brought a certain level of courage to it. Uh, to do what was necessary to, to be able to get there because it's not easy. But I, but what I did feel, I mean, I really had a chance to feel my body at 100% capacity was capable of achieving. And I think everybody in their life should should commit to something where they go all the way with it to experience what's possible in this mm -hmm. human dimension. Yeah. So what events did you compete at? I competed in two events. I was a cyclist yeah. and I competed in the individual sprints, which is a thousand meters with two or three guys on the velodrome, which is like racing inside of a cup. Right. You, you say know. like, oh, you know, it's not life or death, but that seems like yeah, you could is. probably die, actually, if you fall off one of those things. Well, you know, and then I, I drove the tandem, which is the bicycle built for two. It mm. was an event at that time. And, and literally, you're, you're traveling like 10 football fields in maybe 10 seconds. That's Holy how fast cow. you're going. That's crazy. Yeah, and it's, I mean, only, you're only wearing a shorts and, and a jersey, and if... And if you crash and the bike breaks apart, then, you know, it's it's you sliding on wood. Indefinitely, yeah. Yeah, it's like, so again, you know, there are fatalities in the sport. It's right. not common. But I, but I think that, you know, the bigger statement here is about, I think everybody needs to do something where they have to learn to go all in. Yeah. And they have to learn to commit and they have to learn to transcend the limitations that they impose upon themselves about what they believe they can't do. Right. You know, because, I mean, quite honestly, Jeremy, it's like, Part of our human nature is that we have more confidence in our ability to fail than we do in our ability to succeed. That's an observation. Yeah. And, and we have to learn our way beyond that by understanding that we do have a human nature that's fear-based that wants to hold us back. But there is a champion's nature also that wants to succeed and create a life of contribution and value. And we have to learn to what that is and we have to learn how to apply it. We need to maintain it through its application. Yeah. And people see when you're competing, they see you in that race. They don't see the years and years of training that yeah. go into it. What does the training regimen look like to get to that point for you? I, I was uh, I was a student at the University of Southern California studying sports science. And so what I do, it was about a, a 80, 85, 90 mile uh, round trip every day to school that I rode my bike. Really? So what I did, I, I, I uh, rode out my chapters on index cards and I built a little platform on my handlebars. Oh wow. So I studied while I was making the ninety mile commute. Jeez. And then when I got back home I, you know, got my Volkswagen panel van and I drove to the velodrome where I do then training on top of that. So it was really, you know, two full time occupations yeah. to be able to get there and uh, you know, that's what it takes to get the job done. But you know, the, again the sacrifices in what you don't do right. to have a chance to let your best self be your life platform. To me, that's a sacrifice. And there's only one person that could turn the pedals of our life. And, you know, that's really us. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, you know, you don't wait to feel like it. You just do it. Yeah. Otherwise, nobody's going to do anything, you know. So what's it like then? When did you stop cycling? Yeah, I, well, I, I've never stopped. I ride every day <laughs> yeah. after a podcast, a beautiful day here. But I, I, I stopped a couple years after the Olympics for a couple of reasons. Is that to perform at the Olympic level... Um, even a half a percent difference is winning or losing or don't even show up because right. you're not going to even make the final. Yeah. And 
because um, you know I was interested in academics, I was interested in uh, art, I was interested in sport. Um, I knew that after two years after the Olympics that you know I needed to complete my master's degree because I wanted to, and I just knew that I didn't have it in me to continue in the cycling at that level and that intensity. So you know I retired a couple years after the Olympics. I did continue to compete, but then there was this gradual kind of mentality shift you know, towards academics and, and these other elements of life that, that were equally important to me. Yeah. So you focus that intensity and energy on deal, then the yeah. academic portion. Just, just swapped it, swapped it out. Yeah. 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 And so I want to hear about the early days, the inspiration behind the champion's blueprint. When was the first inclination that you were going to crack this and form crack the champion's book. blueprint? Well, it's like, I, I've always had a curiosity and I've always understood human nature really well. And I noticed that if I saw this behavior, it was going here. Mm -hmm. And people may say they want this, but what they're saying, they're going here, they're not going here where they think they're going. So I always had a curiosity about this. And so when I had my mentors after my dad you know, left and we went on welfare, last time I saw my dad, I had really good mentors in my life. They came from sport, they came from stage, they came from life itself, they came from business, and they shared with me their secrets on how they became iconic. And so I looked at what they did. I applied to my life. I made an Olympic team. I graduated from USC as a scholarship student. So I, I had some good foundations. Yeah. Then there were some other observations that I saw that I was naturally curious about. And I really understood that you know, living a life of serial success and achievement and uh, contribution, it's not an accident. It's the purposeful outcome of very deliberate actions. Yeah. And I saw that early. You know, When I was a kid, when I was 10, and I, I trained well, I won. You know, and the guys that didn't train well and wanted to only train when they wanted to train didn't win. Right. And that wasn't that wasn't good enough for me, you know? It's like I wanted a chance to explore the possibility. You know, it's like I wasn't doing this to prove anything to anybody. You know, I wasn't gonna prove people wrong. I didn't care about that. I wanted to explore like what was possible. Mm hmm So that Just was maximize your potential and what you yeah, what your ability you, is. Yeah, and it's like trying harder, you know, we go back to that theme, trying harder isn't guaranteed. Because I saw a lot of people being very, try really hard, that, that didn't, didn't make it. I saw other people try all sorts of magic potions and do all sorts of other stuff that right. didn't make it. So I, I knew that success was too predictable to be an accident. So I just needed to understand the model mm -hmm. and the method of how it gets done, realizing that most of the methods that people use are myth. They're based on myth that can't deliver. But there is a reality here that needs to be sifted out of it. So you know, been in the achievement space for 40 years, myself, but also helping others, whether it's Olympians winning gold medals, whether it's businessmen making millions of dollars, or whether it's thought leaders moving to the next level, there's something different than just the technical side of the discipline. Right. It's about how you think, it's about how you show up, really, and how you make decisions is really what the distinguishing difference is. So let's start from the beginning because it's a blueprint, right? So where do you start people with the champion's blueprint? Well, it always starts what you bring to the blueprint. You bring your goal, you bring motivation, and you also bring your plan. Mm -hmm. And so where we always start in the blueprint, we always start the first step is always legacy. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, isn't that the, always the last thing? It, it's a list mm -hmm. of things that were achieved in a lifetime. It can be that, but if it is, then it, you don't learn anything from it. And so when we start with legacy, what we're saying is that in the life area, whether it's business, whether it's health, whether it's finances, yeah. whether it's intellectual, whether it's spiritual, emotional, or mental, or physical, different life areas, you choose the life area, and let's decide how you want that to end at the end of life. And so when you have a legacy statement that's written, mm -hmm. that you look at, how you want your race to end, Yeah. why that's critical for several reasons. Number one is that every opportunity in life, you can measure that against your legacy statement mm. and you can decide whether I'm going to pursue that or not. Right. So it acts as a filter. It's like what you're saying. It's decision making. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it also keeps you in integrity, meaning that you're not going to do anything that doesn't serve your greater purpose. But if you haven't decided that, then people all try all sorts of things and they start things, they stop things, they waste a lot of time and effort and resources because they don't have a primary filter. The other thing about the uh, um, why a legacy is important 
is it acts as a compass heading for you. And so it never allows you to stray off the reservation, so to speak, or put you in harm's way. And that's why it's important. The, the other thing about legacy is that since everything we do is measured against it, and it's meant to be modified, it's not a straitjacket, right. but since everything is measured against it, then you have holism or coherence in your life because everything adheres to the same outcome. So you're not split, you're not diverse, you're not conflicted. So that's why we always start with legacy. What's the biggest challenge people have when they're starting on this journey? Because they haven't gone through something like this. What, what's the biggest challenge with legacy that they have with the foundation? I, I think they've never been taught to think big enough about what it is or given themselves permission to think about what they really want. Yeah. They start to get too practical. It's like, yeah. well, nobody in my family's ever done that. Yeah. You know, or it's going to take this much money or I need this material. Right. You know, well, that's they have not like what, limited beliefs type of thing. Well, that's that's human nature. Yeah. It's not belief. Culture hasn't taught them that. Yeah. You know, that's that's our our human nature is fear based. Yeah. It's all about survival. It's not about excellence. It's about making decisions out of what you stand to lose. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. But we also have a champion's nature. So, but we're not taught champion's nature. We're taught human nature that we should embrace it. I say don't embrace it because you're not going to live a life of vitality. It isn't going to happen. Champions make their choices out of what they stand to gain. That doesn't come naturally to us. Yeah. We're all fearful about stuff. So first off is learning the skill to really contemplate big or be authentic with what we really want, even though maybe it seems out of reach. Maybe it seems too big. But I think we need to learn that skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's yours? Legacy... Yeah, I, I'm very, I'm very clear on my legacy. Is that I want to be a person that leaves performance models for people to learn how to become a serial success, mm -hmm. because I've cracked the code on it, and I know how to do it. I, I know how to succeed. It's not about trying harder. It's not having about having a more extensive plan. It's about being able to remove resistance. So, I'm in the process. The Champion Blueprint is a model. It shows people how to remove the resistance to gain acceleration to, mm -hmm. to achieve their goals. Right. The whole reason why I get up every day, I get up for one reason only, and that's to help people become serial successes by following a proven model that works. So I want to leave models. I want to prove. I want to leave methods that allow people to live a life that they're capable of, because the gap model and the trying harder does not work. Mm -hmm. So after legacy. Tiger sponsor, what's next? Vision. And when I talk about vision, I'm not talking about the castle on the hill. I'm talking about do you have a vision of how your life will change when your goals achieved? What will it do for you as a person? Mm -hmm. Will you be more confident in yourself? How will you bring value to the world? Is this something that you really want? How will you call people to a higher game? What will they learn from you having achieved this goal? And so if the goal fits the vision that you see, then it's a good goal that should be pursued. Yeah. So what's someone who, there's a lot of people have gone through, that you've taken through this. What's a vision that you heard from someone that really struck you? Well, I, actually one of my clients right now, he wants to have a half a billion dollar uh, mortgage business. And, and I, I, I know him and he's going to do it. Yeah. Be, because I know he's got the right elements to make this happen. And he's given himself permission to be able to really connect with what he believes is possible and an aspiration that is achievable, uh, assuming that he learns the process of how to be able to make that and how to achieve that. Yeah. So legacy vision, what's next that people should be thinking about? Yeah, they should think about mindset. And when I think about mindset, most people think, oh, yeah, it's positive thinking. I just need to do my affirmations in the morning and think good thoughts and it's going to happen. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about IQ. I'm not talking about grade point average. I'm not talking about SAT scores. I'm talking about do you really understand what it's going to take to go to where you want to go? You know, and, and do you really have what it takes? For example, a friend of mine had a chance to be Usher's guy in a, a world tour with Usher. And I say, well, before you decide, let's take a look and make sure you got the mentality to do this, the mindset. Mm. You're going to be on the road for nine months. Mm. You're going to get three hours of sleep a night. You're going to make appointments people aren't going to keep. There's going to be backbiting. There's going to be gossip. You're going to get blamed for stuff. You're not going to be able to exercise right. away from your kids. 
Yeah. So do you have the mindset to really encounter the challenges yeah. that you're going to face? Yeah. Because if you don't, don't do it. Don't even get yeah. started. You paint that picture, that realistic picture. Yeah. yeah, it's like real. You know, most people say, well, you know, if I look at this thing real, then I'm talking myself into less than I can get. I don't think that's true. Because no, no champion in any discipline, no serial success ever does yeah. that. Yeah. They're, they're really real about what the challenge is, is going to be. Right, right. For you, it was riding 90 miles to school while you're going full time and my cards and putting them on my handlebars and yeah, you know, studying when I was tapes when I was coming back in my VW panel van. Yeah, yeah. So, what's after mindset? It's health. You know, if you don't have health, don't start because if you start, you use up a bunch of resources and then mm -hmm. you get sick or injured or you blow yourself up, then it was ultimately be uh you know i should have guessed that one for you health it, yeah. It should. yeah so you gotta have health number five don't start unless you have verifiable health and you know you can stay in it for the long term to be able to make it happen so what's your regiment look like as far as uh, nutrition or food you know i'm sure you get that question people yeah, ask well, you, that well, you know i get up in the morning and uh you know i i start the day and you know for breakfast i have a smoothie you know, it's like a green smoothie. I make it myself, fresh every day, because I like it. Yeah. You know, a couple eggs, protein powder in there, all sorts of other hocus pocus. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's it, it's green. And it looks so bad, it must be good for you. It actually, tastes good. So you know, it starts with a smoothie. Uh, you know, I have a handful of nuts. You know, and then uh, you know, I'll do some herbs, some adaptogens that kind of get all my organs to kind of work together to support my health. And you know, I'll drink you know, water in the morning, and then at lunch I'll have a salad with maybe some protein and. And then I exercise every day. You know, I don't exercise hard every day. I do extreme training. I extreme. I train extremely hard and I extreme, extremely easy. You know, I, I alternate days or I mm -hmm. go by how I feel. I want to make sure that I don't, you know, physically overextend myself. But I try really hard on days I feel good. Right. I get you know seven hours of sleep a night. You know, um, only because if you get sick or injured or make bad choices because of mental fatigue from not getting enough sleep, then. Right. Ultimately, it's not going to serve you well. Right. So it's moderate in all things. I, I take it kind of seriously. I'm not compulsive, but I'm I'm persistent and I'm tenacious, and that's kind of the way I do it. I don't eat a bunch of sugar. I don't eat uh, dairy products. Um, you know, I'm I'm pretty almost like a, I, I would guess a, you would call it like a paleo diet esque. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of vegetables. You know, fish. You know, modest on the fruits. Really, you know, no breads or grains. So take me back to 1972 because now we know these things and they're becoming, you know, health information is more prevalent. What was it like then? What were your, what were you eating then to, to train? Yeah, it was kind of the same thing. It was, you know, was pretty it? Much okay. protein. Yeah, it's pretty protein heavy to, to build strong muscles. You know, we actually took liver tablets at that time. And, um, you know, we were, I think it, the leading edge of what was available then, you know, it's just the training is so hard. And of course, there weren't the fast food restaurants, you know, that we have today. The garbage, you know. I mean, right. you eventually eat the cardboard box, you know, may have more nutrition than the food itself. <laughs> right. So, you know, we there wasn't that issue. So, you know, we ate well. We encouraged each other. We had a tribe, so we all worked together to support each other. So mm -hmm. it was a lot easier to stay really compliant because we encouraged each other with diet. We yeah. encouraged each other with sleep and rest. We helped each other like technically, and so uh, I think that's another important element. You know, you surround yourself with people of same altitude and same value that can keep the things that have to go right intact so that you are always in a state of carrying momentum forward. Yeah. So after health, what's next? Uh, it's it's uh, assets. You've got to have assets. You've got to have space, time, equipment, funding, mm. team, plan. You've got to have that. And if you don't have the personal knowledge, you don't have the skill, and you don't have the material resources necessary, then don't start. Yeah. And so that that's actually Division One of the Champions Blueprint, where you're just preparing to make sure that when you start actively pursuing your goal, that you're properly prepared, which most people don't do. Most people just start, and they think the universe is going to fill in the gaps for them, make it up as they go. And that's never proven itself to be true. Another another myth exploded. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what what comes up for the assets for challenges that people face with, with that portion? I, I think they, they don't have enough inventory. You know, it's like you need at least 30% more than you think you need in terms of resources. You know, if you think you need four cubes of butter, well, why don't you get six? 
You know, if you think that you need someone to help you, why don't you get two people? Mm-hmm. You know, if you think you need five dollars, well, why don't you get ten? Mm-hmm. You know, so you always have more than you expect, but but don't leave it up to yourself to vet it. Have somebody come in that's an expert and let them look at the list that you think that you need to be able to get the job done and let them verify it. Mm-hmm. Once you've collected your inventory, make sure they come back and they look at it and they tell you, yeah, it's all here. You're good to go. Mm-hmm. Do, you think, do you think people underestimate what they, what they actually need? Oh, yeah, 100%. Right. I mean, in today's world, people think that whatever you visualize, you can manifest. It's not true. Right. You know, you're limited by your resources, the quality of your plan, and your skills, you know? And so you always want to look at that first, you know, on division one, the preparation side of the blueprint to make mm-hmm. sure that you got it. Yeah. If you don't, don't start. Yeah. Be, because the, the universe isn't going to fill in the gaps, you know, most likely. And so let's be responsible, not reckless about goal achievement. Mm-hmm. So what's after assets? Well, that's where we go into division two. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're actually in the performance division. That's where it's boots on the ground. And the very first thing that we do there is called the climb. And this is where you're actually for the first time actually actively implementing your plan. Mm -hmm. And this is about gaining early momentum and it's also about conserving your resources because your mentality already sees you at the top. It doesn't realize that there may be, you know, in Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers book, there may be 10,000 hours that it's going to take to kind of get to where you want to go. And so you've got to be and show restraint. You have to conserve your resources. You have to build your uh, momentum, you know, prudently not try to do too much too fast and that's what climbing the wall is all about most people because it's a honeymoon phase but most people get started they already see themselves in victory circle and that's the time where you got to kind of hold back you see this at the tour de france you know the rookies are always you know they're laughing and they're talking and they're using a lot of energy that they're going to need for the third week right you're dead tired you got two thousand miles in your brain and in your body you know where the veterans there they're they're conserving their energy well in advance because they they know that they need it later Mm-hmm. So that's that's what the climbs. It's about getting real. It's about getting to a point where you know what this is harder than I thought it was going to be. You know, which of course it is. I mean, General Patton said that a plan is a great plan, but once you get started, then you see its reality. Right. I think Mike Tyson so has some quote like that too. Like you have a plan to get punched in the face or something. <laughs> and then... Well, that's it. So right, you yeah. know, the climb is let's get started. Let's conserve our resources. Right. And let's get a sense of what it really is. And then once we get a sense of what it really is, then, then we've had a reality check and we can recalibrate. Mm-hmm. That's what the climb is all about. And the other thing I want to say about this is that, you know, in the climb, your goal is to have a breakout performance, meaning that you want to have some indication that you can actually do this. So for me in the Olympics, you know, my goal was to get to the Olympics, but that was too big of a reach. My mo- most immediate performance goal was let me compete in a competition regionally where there's someone that is performing at the Olympic level, mm. let me see how I do against them. Yeah. And so when I competed against them and I was performing at their level, then I knew I could do it. Right. So there was an appropriate outcome uh, that I needed to achieve and the climb to, to verify that I could actually do this. Because if, if the goal's too big, you're going to talk yourself out of it. When it right. gets hard, you're going to say, I'm done, I can't do this. You know, it's classic. Yeah, yeah. So that's the climb. Yeah. Yeah. So then after that, yeah, go ahead. Then after that's pursuit. This is where after, okay, now I'm real. This is going to be 10,000 hours. It's harder than I thought. Now I know what this is. So I'm now going to start pursuing my goal. Right. And I'm going to do that by developing the technical skill that's required to achieve the goal. Yeah. And I'm going to evolve it and become so proficient at it that I can't get it wrong. And when I get so good at it and it's so highly evolved, I can't get it wrong, then it's only a matter of time before I achieve my goal. Yeah. So all of a sudden, that's where we show up. You know, you're on top of the podium. You get the gold medal. Congratulations, you've achieved your goal. And it's an interesting place to be because if it's a one-time goal, like the Olympics are climbing Mount Everest, then that's where you're done with the process. And you go back and choose another goal. But if you want to repeat the goal, like go back for a second Olympics or climb Mount Everest two or three or five more times, then you have to continue on into the next steps. Yeah. And the next step after the goal is, is that it, this is called the ascent. And this is where you're actually going from goal achievement to uh, a mastery of process, mm. where you can repeat your goal as if it's like your new normal. Yeah. 
and you've learned to uh, address all the technical challenges to get there. And that's what the ascent is all about. And this is also a place where most people give up because they really? just, yeah, they just think I can't do it. And that's because they're not prepared. And one of the advantages of the blueprint is because it's progressive, you're going through the steps yeah. and history has shown us, we can always say, well, uh, you know, the, the deal is here, Jeremy, is that if you're in step five, then we know what's happening in this progression. We know what patterns are going to show up because history has showed us. So we're ready to grab the ones that are beneficial to moving forward towards your goal. And also the ones that are going to stall, we walk around it. So with the blueprint, you're never lost. You always know where you are. You always know what's coming, so you're never taken by surprise. Yeah. And so, so that's the, after the goal. We want to then repeat the goal so it becomes our new normal. You know, this has so many applications, right? People apply it to business, sports. What's the strangest well, application you've seen someone use this blueprint for? I mean, that's that's a really good question because it can be used down to baking a cookie. Right, right. It can be used to define a business cycle. It can be used to run your life yeah. against. Have you seen someone apply this to something that you would never have thought of applying the blueprint to? You know, you know, there was there was actually this guy that came to me and he knew that I knew something about sports and he wanted to train racing pigeons. <laughs> so I wanted to know if there was anything I could do to help him make better racing pigeons. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, this is kind of a universal blueprint and, you know, it's nonspecific, but it's going to only help you execute your plan. Yeah. And make sure that you avoid the resistances that would prevent you from developing the best racing pigeons in the universe. So he actually applied it, and he actually found that it actually worked, and he created world-class racing pigeons. There so you go. Event, <laughs> that should be the tagline on your website. You can not only have success in business, but we have helped world-class racing pigeons. That's, that's, that's exactly right. So uh, there's never an application that this uh, cannot enhance. Every program should have this attached to it. Nobody should do without this. Only because if you cannot control and you don't have a a, a goal path, a success path, yeah. you can't overcome the resistance in life. Yeah. I think we all know that. Yeah. Unless you have a set path and you manage that path by applying very specific principles right. to known patterns as they emerge, it's impossible to go from where you are to where you want to go. Right. And, and I know good. you've you've implemented this in many different places, including Fortune 500 companies. If so, there's a business owner right now who's watching this and looking yep. at this, how did they start to implement this in their company? I mean, you know, besides themselves. Well, no, this this is you know a company is is the same analogy to a life. You know, there are very specific things that have to happen to create a successful business, right. which are exactly the same thing in life. So what I do with my business clients. And it, honestly, it's like all of my work is in business. I, I don't really spend a lot of time in sports anymore. If you, you want to win a gold medal and a guy can do it, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. But but all my time is actually spent in business right mm -hmm. now. So the first thing that we would want to do, we would want to identify exactly in what step is their business. So for example, you know, if we have the blueprint here, I would say, well, you know, which of the steps are you currently performing in? Because we got to know that. Because there are certain things that you're going to be at risk at, depending upon where you are. And it also allows us to look back over time and see maybe what things you didn't do that you should have done mm -hmm. to make sure that you have an adequate foundation. Yeah. And it's like if we discover things back here that uh, were not complete, that can hurt you when you're over here, well, we better go back. We better make sure that we pick up the uh, luggage that we left at the hotel so that you're able to address the problem here yeah. because a stall here may be because of something that was not done here. So this gives us an accountability of all the things that have got to be there to get to where you want to go. And yeah. it, it's like, see, unless we know where you are, see, the way that most people do it, it's the equivalent of being given a treasure map, right? And right. it's like the treasure is buried here, and then we've got the predators, the cliff, and the booby traps over here. And so there's only one thing missing on the treasure map, and what is that? It's like, where are you, right? Because if we don't know where you are, right. if we don't have reference, this, yeah. then we have no idea whether the next action is towards the cliff or whether it's towards the trader. You don't know that. So the first thing we always want to do is locate, like, you know, where you are in the blueprint. Yeah. 
And then the second question we want to ask is that if we can identify the step you're in, what resistance pattern are you running that will stall your process? Mm -hmm. And then the third question, what principle do we need to apply to eliminate the resistance and the pattern that you're running? See, a lot of these patterns are actually myths that we believe to be true. So unless you know the patterns, you may think that it's a principle where it may not be. And so we need to know that. The other thing is, I can say, well, Jeremy, you know, we've just gotten here to the top. So you're next going to be entering, you know, step number seven here. And step number seven, you will encounter this. So we can actually peek around the corner and we know what's coming. Mm. So there is no guessing. I mean, how'd you like to have a map that's got a GPS that you plug in the destination, but you got to know where you are. Yeah. See, the GPS knows something that we don't. The GPS knows where you are. I definitely need a GPS, yes. <laughs> it also knows the destination, so it can chart the course, right? Yeah. But if we know our goal, meaning the destination, the GPS destination, but we don't know where we are, then the GPS doesn't do any good. Right. So we need to know something about that. So that's really what the Champion Blueprint yeah. does. It allows us to find the first point on where we are. You locate where they are first, yeah. Yeah, and then we can go back and pick up the baggage we left at the hotel, and we also know it's coming, so we're not taken by surprise. So, so where that, can people get that is the question. Do they go on your website or? There's, there's, there's two things. So you yeah. can go on the, my website, like right now, and they get information about the workshops that we'll be doing. And then when the online program gets put up, which it, which it will be here in the not-too-distant future, they'll be able to then uh, purchase or invest in the uh, online program itself, and they'll be able to be their own, uh, their own tutor to take them through this. And for those people that are interested, you know, I also do, you know, uh, executive coaching at the highest level that I call cornerman coaching that yeah. is also available all that all that information is available on my website which is www.dr like drjeffspencer.com yeah www.drjeffspencer there's a wealth of information there so I, I do suggest everyone check it out um, you know there's drjeffspencer.com and then there's backslash the champion or the dash champions dash blueprint that you know kind of maps it out a little bit too so I suggest people go to that. You know, on the level, like we talked about some of the, the highest level people that things that yeah. you've done at your pinnacle and the highest level people you've helped. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what what advice you gave to whoever you decide, whether it's a Lance Armstrong or Tiger Woods, that was interesting that we all should know about too, as if we were a fly in the wall? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a great example. So I'm sitting outside answering some emails all of a sudden in my inbox pops up an email that said can you help and so I opened it up and it said well I'm currently working with the uh, leader of the world championship and he's probably to win the gold medal in the London Olympics but he's starting to melt down can you help hmm. and so as an Olympian naturally I was interested and so I contacted the uh, person that sent me the email and so eventually I talked with the athlete and I said to him look here's the problem is that you know number one you're physically ready to win the gold medal tonight but you're mentally disconnected from this you know, for basically one reason, one reason only, is that you're two and a half weeks away from the Olympic final. You spent a couple of decades to get here. You got the best coach. You got the best chiropractor. You've got the best equipment. You got the right. best dog. You got the best of everything. The assets are in line. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. There's only one problem: is that you're unraveling. Hmm. You know. So I said, you know, here's here's the problem: is that everyone on your team is now subscribing to the gap model. And so what they think, you got to try harder. And in this instance, they believe that you need to find the missing detail and attend to every small detail to be capable of winning the gold medal. Yeah. And I said, the problem with that is, is that it's fear-based. It's not about what you stand to gain. It's about what you stand to lose. So you guys have already lost. Just want you to know that. You're not going to win. And I said, the I'm sure other, they loved you saying that. <laughs> well, no, I was talking with the guy. I wasn't talking with his team. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. Because I knew the team wouldn't listen to me. Right. Because they were all scared out of their wits. They needed this guy to win to look good, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I said, they weren't going to listen to me. I already knew that. So that's why the conversation was with the athlete. Yeah. And so I said, so hear me loud and clear on this. You still got time to, to change this and win. Yeah. So here's what you need to know is that every one of you guys thinks that it's about the details. And you guys think that. Unless you cover all the details, you're not capable of putting in the perfect jump to win the gold medal. And the problem with that is that in your own mind, there's always going to be a, a phantom detail that you're not going to find that you're going to invest all your confidence in that you think you need to discover to win. Mm -hmm. You've already lost. You're done. 
So what I suggest that you do is this, is that it's not about perfection. It's about doing the one to two percent that counts, which is a famous Spencerism. Hmm. Tell me about, yeah, I want more famous Spencerisms. Yeah, go uh, on. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now. So it's about the one to two percent that counts. Yeah. I'm not an 80-20 guy. I'm like, let's do the one or two things that matter to gain access to the 98% benefit. Mm. Yeah. I'm an 80-20 guy. So I said, Greg, look, two things and you win. The first thing is don't change your warm-up. Mm. Because you changed your warm-up trying to prevent, trying to get the advantage and your body's scared and it doesn't want to perform now. It's confused. So go back to your old warm up. It's free. You don't need to learn it. Just go back to what you did. That's percent number one. Yeah. I said percent number two is you know the distance that you need to start your run up. He was a long jumper. I said, don't focus on the board. Focus on the speed of the first four steps that will determine where your foot hits the board. Mm. You do those two things, it's gold medal, instant gold medal. But to do that, you've got to insulate yourself from all the experts because they're nervous, they're going to just talk you into losing, and you're headed on a collision course, and if you want your moniker and your epitaph to read the guy that could that didn't, then just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. But if you follow my advice, the one or two things that have to go right, again, that's, that's what the principles are in the champion's blueprint. The principle is, what's the one or two things that have to go right in this situation? Right. So we just applied the blueprint, and he won the gold medal. Wow. And so I was really happy for him because... That's a major achievement, but he Huge. fought the boogeyman. And what he did, he showed us that the gap model doesn't work right. and it doesn't deliver. If you want extraordinary, if you want mediocrity, just continue to do it. But if you want extraordinary, there's another proven way to do it. And so he was our advocate that showed us that, you know, when you're in a faulty achievement model, you can adapt quickly and get massive results by doing the one or two things that have to go right. It's not about the hundreds of things that you must know and apply. It's about what are the key things that have got to go right. So what did he come back and say to you after he won? Well, it started off, you know, seeing him cry on the podium was enough because it meant that he got the monkey off his back. Yeah. Even when he was able to pull it together. You know, and afterwards, you know, I mean, where, how do you say thanks, you know? I mean, I wasn't the only guy there, but they brought me in to get the structure right. Because they had all the experts, and it's like, okay, you got all the experts, and how come he's melting down? Right. It's crazy, you know, because they didn't have somebody that understood how to win. You know, that's why they call it the champion's blueprint because it's a model, it's a proven model. And so I knew where the problem was. I said, Greg, it's right here, man, right there in the climb. You're scared to death, you know, and you don't have the mindset here in step number three. The principle is here. It's not about perfection. It's about the one to two percent that counts. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what those two things are. Presto, instant gold medal. Mm. So, anyhow, great success story. I love that. I, yeah, well, I love it for him too. So thanks for saying that. So, what is another one that you told you instructed someone that's the one to two percent that counts? That they were outside their head and everything was, you yeah. know. Sure. Well, I, I was at, I was at an event um, where someone had to go on stage and perform. And this was a, a very make it or break a performance because there were a lot of people in the audience that um, could would determine their career whether or not right? they had enough trust to engage this person, right? Mm -hmm. And so she came to me and said, God, what do I say? I don't even know what to do. You know? And I said, okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to do some diaphragmatic breathing to slow your mind down. And then you're going to say one word, the most important first word, that's all you're going to think about. When you go out on stage, you say the one word. Because once you say the one word, all your preparation is going to follow that one word. That's all you need to do. Diaphragmatic breathe for a minute. One word, boom. She went out, she crushed it. Hmm. And it w was really a, a make it or break it pivotal moment for her. And it was, again, 1% diaphragmatic breathe to slow the mind down. Second percentage was first word, lead with that, then everything else that you prepared for is going to follow on behind it, just yeah. exactly as you prepare it. Yeah. yeah. So what are some more Spencerisms that we should know? Um, gosh, some Spencerisms. You know, I'm so full of these things that <laughs> I, I usually channel. They just flow off your tongue. They, they do. I usually channel them. You know, they're not things that <laughs> readily, you know, readily come to mind. Um, oh, yeah. It's like if you do something – if. You know, a good choice today that hurts you tomorrow is a bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, it's another, it's another famous one. So what book should we check out that you've, that you've written? Well, I, you know, the, the champion blueprint is actually, um, it's with the agent right now. It's going to be shopped around. It, it will be a book mm-hmm. eventually. I, I actually wrote mm-hmm. a book in 2008 called Turn It Up, How to Perform at Your Highest Level for a Lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew you had a book out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually quite successful. And it's, it's high density. It was meant to be as a resource guide where you could take with you. You could open up any page and start reading. You would get value immediately from anything. And then if there were a particular area that you were interested in, yeah. you could go to the bibliography, the table of contents, and you could look it up and go there as a resource. I wanted yeah. it to be a resource, like what do I do? If I only got five minutes to learn something, right. what can I learn in five minutes? Right. So that was a resource book you know, for that. Um, it may be out of print, I don't know, but sniff around and see if a copy is available. Yeah. And it's a great uh, uh, primer. Uh, for the champion blueprint that uh, probably is going to be available i would say probably next year is my guess so when you go into richard branson and his companies what kind of things do you go over with them richard was a different situation i was actually on necker island with him Mm. and it was an event that was hosted by joe polish who is one of the world's most foremost uh, marketers so i was kind of there within that context it wasn't there to to advise Richard, I was there to participate uh, with Joe and Joe's group in yeah. terms of fellowshipping at that very high level. So let's just take you know any business. Yeah. The first thing that I want to know in the business again is where are you guys? Because if I can locate you know where you are, then I know your state of readiness for where you are. But I also know what's coming. And if we need to shore up the underpinnings and prevent a cave-in. Well, we can intercept it at that point because there's a point you may need to do something that's a drastic magnitude to shore something up when there's no obvious indications of that. And so with the blueprint, I can ferret that out yeah. and I can determine whether we're on safe ground or whether we're on quicksand. I don't know. First thing I want to know, where are you in this process? So I gather some data, I identify it, I gather more data to confirm their readiness for it. If we've got to stop and we've got to go back and pick up some stuff to shore it up rather than proceed ahead, then that's the recommendation that yeah. I give. Yeah. You know, Dr. Spencer, when you had your mindset, whenever you were six or seven, you're like, I'm going to be in the Olympics. What was, I, after you finished the Olympics yeah. games, what was your next, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah, well, it was, um, it was to get through school and pursue my art, my glass art work. Mm-hmm. That was the, the main goal at that time. Mm-hmm. Because I, I was, you know, pretty gifted at the art side of things, and I, I, I wanted to make sure I completed the loop of my master's degree in college because I knew that after that it would be much more difficult to come back for it. So I stayed in the game and I got that, and then at that point, then I uh, really began my formal career, you know, in art. But I was also um, working as a consultant in the uh, uh, professional athletic world mm-hmm. as someone that developed conditioning programs and also looked at athletes, but I found that uh, it always led to how do I prevent and manage injuries and it always asked how do I become a champion rather than just, you know, is there a better exercise? It always led to this other uh, line of questioning. So with that, I went back to chiropractic college because I was passionate working with my hands and I was passionate about natural healing methods and performance methods. So I went back to chiropractic college. And uh, so then what happened as a result of that, I had kind of like a a three-pronged struggle I had the experiential knowledge of being an Olympian. I knew how to get to the top and stay there. I, I knew the body performance side with my master's degree, and now I knew how to get and stay well and prevent injuries and manage them because the chiropractic. So with that, I became like a one-stop Jiffy Lube shopping center right. for what do I do? So I, I became like really actually an expert in the whole yeah. rather than an expert in the part because you know we kind of have this expert mentality like the specialist mm. knows more. Well, not really because I mean he knows more in the slice of the pie. Right. But he doesn't understand the pie. Right. And Not really, the whole picture like you had. Yeah. Yeah. So really the secret to this is that when we look at the gold medal performance, we look at the zone performance, we look at spontaneous healing, what they all share in common is a cohesive biology that's all geared towards ultimate performance and state of health. So when we have somebody that understands the parts and can decide how much of what needs to be there to create holism and synergy in the, in, in the system, 
then you get an exponential growth in the output of the system that transcends the sum of the parts. So I became the guy that could help craft that in a business. It could be in a uh, sporting event right. or an ambition. So I kind of became the expert in the whole. Right. And it wasn't uh, good at none. It was expert in the whole so the specialist parts could actually uh, provide their, their greatest value right. to, to the enterprise. Yeah, I mean, what I wrote down when I was doing my research about you is, you know, people call you the corner man. Well, right. I want to add something to that personally. I want to, to say corner man, but then I wanted to add turn the corner man. So oh, it's yeah. like well, corner well, man is like the health stuff. I'm like, but you help people turn the corner also. So I wanted to put turn the corner you know in there too. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's, that's brilliant. That's, yeah. that's brilliant. Thank you for saying that. That's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Um, and so I want to talk about. Forget about all the stuff in the media about Lance Armstrong, but what was it like working with him? Obviously, he performs at such a high level. Well, that's you know that's not an accident either. You know, it's there. There, there are many things that people can learn of immense value from Lance. There was nobody that prepared as diligently as he did in terms of his meticulous preparation. Um, you know, the other thing that we can learn from Lance is, you know, after his illness. It's like he never looked at life the same, meaning that most people decide how much effort they're going to put into something based on a percentage of possibility of return. Mm. You know, they play the averages, which is usually too low, and they talk themselves out of some really good stuff. You know, it's like, you know, my view, Lance never did that. You know, he uh, felt an obligation to put in the best of him because he got a second chance having survived but was literally a death sentence in cancer. Right. And he also um, never looked at, at difficulty or exertional pain as a foe. He, he looked at it as a reminder that he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And most people, you can't do that unless you've been to a place where you've faced something so bad so deeply. You, you can't even go there. Right. And so by definition, you can't really be the best that you could be because you can't go that extra percentage where Lance could because the exertional pain was a reminder that he was still alive. That's an amazing thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, when he, you hear him say that, you know, pain is temporary, but quitting is forever. He actually said that. Yeah. That's an amazing statement. Your average person couldn't say that, let alone execute it or understand it. And, you know, when he says you get, when you get a second chance, you go all the way, it doesn't have to be a second life chance from cancer. It has to do with mm -hmm. every moment. Right. You know, and it's like, are, are you willing to step into evolving your skills as a life platform of contribution where at the end of your life you have no regrets? Sure, some mistakes we all do, but if you have mistakes, it means that you are at least reaching. No mistakes to me means mediocrity. It means that you weren't trying, hard, trying enough. hard enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at least in, in my mind. You know, and Lance was always very grateful to his uh, teammates. He'd always say thank you and he'd let everybody else go and care and everything like that. And so again, there's a lot that we can, another thing that we can learn from Lance is that, you know, our judgments of him don't help us. We're the losers because if we judge him, uh, then we don't have the chance to learn some very valuable lessons from mm -hmm. his life as they've been derived so far. And you mean people discount other things because of Certain of course, they, they do. yeah, they'll, yeah. They'll, they'll reject because of you know Lance's drug admission. They'll they'll dismiss everything about him because of that, right? Which which I think makes them the loser, right? Because there are things that, that you can definitely learn from him. And the other thing about this that we can learn from this is that you know if you expect to learn your life lessons from perfect people, well, don't Chan, don't plan on learning much of anything from anybody, right? You know, and and our judgments are, are what hurt us. You know, I mean. So again, there's even that level of, of lesson that we can, you know, learn uh, fr from that and, and from him. Yeah. So Dr. Spencer, you know, fr from your career, it looks like you, you have this goal, you ascend, you achieve, you ascend, you achieve. What's been the biggest challenge for you professionally? There haven't been a lot. I mean, in the sense that I've always kind of known that I could put something down and move on to an entirely different discipline. You know, somebody asked me, you know, what would your epitaph be? You know, and it would be uh, 
I showed up for duty, meaning that when something occurs to me where a shift is required, I can do that. Because I've never kind of looked at what I've done as being something of current relevancy to, to my concept or belief in self. I looked at it as a historic part of my record of what I've done, and I've always been able to put things down and move to other things with the same level of commitment. Right. So I've always you know, been able to do that really quite easily. And so, you know, I mean, the what's next is an open question, but it's, it's very clear to me that my legacy is to be able to create uh, achievement models for people that allow them to be able to become a serial success and be responsible to the process in it, meaning that they honor their privilege of their friends and their family, their mentors, their uh, benefactors, right. and that they show other people in life what's possible as an example of that, so that they've honored their uh, their talents, but they've also done it responsibly where they haven't become assuming ha been, you know, a human sacrifice in the process, or they haven't also hurt other people through neglect by pursuing things either recklessly or irresponsibly. Yeah. That's clearly, you know, my mission. So, you know, the future, what does it hold? I think books for sure. You know, new programs are going to be coming down. There will be uh, retreats and things like that that are all driven by the central theme here, the Champions Blueprint model. That history is revealed. Without, yeah. without it, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to be able to manage the resistance of life yeah. without it. So last two questions, Dr. Spencer. This has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your oh, time. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, <clears throat> what's been the lowest point and then how you push through it? That's a good question. I think that, yeah, for sure. A couple, I mean, I would say a real low point for me was in 99 uh, when I had severe mercury poisoning. and But I didn't know mm -hmm. that. And, you know, it was misdiagnosed. Oh, yeah, I got adrenal fatigue. And then you got a systemic mold infection. I just felt like everybody was guessing. Hmm. You know, and the symptoms of that could be ALS. It could be MS. I mean, bad stuff. And so that was very difficult for me because, you know, as an Olympian, if there was an opponent that was tangible that I could see and I could smell, then I could just get better and beat him up in the ring, you know. Right. But this wasn't like this. I was completely subservient to the very dramatic and pronounced and severe collapse of health that I had where I was literally, I was not able to function because of this and to, to face the fact that I may have to live like this the rest of my life, which is a possibility. I've seen nightmares happen to people. That's what life is, you know? Right. And so facing that was very difficult and wondering the path out of it. And is there a path out of it was difficult because it wasn't, an earthly opponent. It was a different thing altogether. That was for sure my 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 my, my low point. Well, for sure. How did you finally get past it, or how did they discover what what it was? I was actually I was in um, Australia for the 2000 Olympics to help the U.S. cycling Olympic team there, and I was there two weeks early to do a series of nutrition lectures throughout the Australia, the the six major cities, five or six major cities there. And so my host, I told him about my experience and what I was experiencing. So why don't you come to my homeopath? And so we called him up, and they just happened to have uh, an appointment available that Thursday afternoon. It was Thursday afternoon, so I went, and she said they got mercury poisoning. Wow! Because they, they did this uh, testing, it was called transdermal testing, where they, they they tested my acupuncture points against things that have been known to produce these symptoms, and they were able to correlate the problem with my body response to it and that's how the first suspicion was uh, was identified so they created a remedy and I actually felt better and so when I got back to the US I found the best person in the US that was qualified to be able to help me overcome the mercury poisoning and eventually uh, it took three to five years to get truly well and mm -hmm. I, I still suffer some of the effects of that I'll never get over but to say that that was the path and so the learning curve from that was is that you know life is unexpected Right. Make sure you do something of value. It's it's not just about do whatever you want. It's about do something of value that outlives you, yeah. so that there's a permanent immortal reminder and a footprint of you yeah. about what you do with your life that calls people to a higher game. Yeah. Also, you can't live life alone. If I didn't have the right doctor and I didn't have the right support system, yeah. I probably never would have recovered. Everyone needs a team. No one's alone.
Right. And then thirdly, you got to have a blueprint. If you don't have a blueprint that shows you how to negotiate life, you know, like this, I've done all the heavy lifting for everybody. It took 50 years to figure this out. Then you're just guessing at your life. And, you know, one thing I can assure you that whenever you go into the jungle, make sure you've got a blueprint or a map. Don't go into the jungle without a blueprint or a map. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a dangerous place. There are predators out there. It's dangerous, you know. So you got to yeah. have targets. You've got to have team. You've got to have a blueprint. Yeah. If you've got that stuff. And you've got to have reverence for your life and decide that you're going to do something with it that creates immense value where you're honored your talents. Yeah. That's what I learned from it. Yeah. So the last question is, what's been the proudest moment? Oh, there's no question. The adoption of our daughter. We had, like, they consider it a miracle adoption. She was 10. This is uh, almost seven years ago. Mm. She was up for adoption for five years, which means what? There's something wrong with me because I'm not adopted. Right, right. And just the difficulty and the challenges that she faced from where she came from are indescribable. But the point is, is that, you can love anybody. You just do it. Yeah. You don't need a special occasion. It's not about you, you know? It's about the value that you bring to them. And so she just turned 17 last Thursday. And so if you ever doubt the value of what you do as a human, the things you say are the things that you do, adopt a kid. Yeah. You know, it's not about us. It's not about our winning for us. It's about... You know, how do you step into your talent? How do you step into your legacy? Yeah. You know, what is it that you're doing that has a lasting and permanent effect on people? You know, those are like the lessons for me. And so yeah. no question about it. We're the lucky ones with our daughter. Right. Has it been easy? No. Uh, have there been extremely difficult moments on a variety of levels? Yeah. But what those difficult moments do, they force you to make a choice about what you place a value on. Yeah. And they force you to have to find a way to live into that value and make a contribution and to be able to hold your ground and to be able to support and protect your territory. Look, if life's too good, there's no reason to change. But if there's no reason to change, then you stay stuck in your habits that aren't serving you well. Yeah. And everybody needs something that's bigger than themselves to call them to a higher game. And for sure, you know, it was our daughter. Where is she from? Uh, Columbia. Okay. So was the process difficult to get to that point to, for the adoption? It took about two years. Yeah. It, it wasn't particularly difficult, actually. I mean, my wife did a lot of the work. You know, it took persistence. Yeah. You know, but but is it roulette? Of course it is. Yeah. You know, when you when you adopt somebody that's ten year olds, you know, people say damaged goods. Who wants to who wants to adopt a ten year old? Damaged goods. I don't want that. Right. You know, there's 150 million kids that need homes. You know, so I mean, there is a, a huge roulette factor to it. But you know, you know, welcome to life. There's a roulette factor to it anyhow. I mean, right. perhaps one of the biggest roulettes is is being unwilling to explore what life's possibility is so you live a life of non-commitment right i mean to me that you know that's that's the tragedy so yeah. you know again that was our path was it tough there have been some rough moments for sure you know our, our daughter's like tarzan's daughter she came from a jungle it's it's different you know the, the scaling and the scope of learning how to appreciate what's out there is just extraordinary and it, yeah. here's the deal it's like you got to have something to get up to that's bigger than you right because if it's all about you then just just prepare for a miserable life where it's never enough you're always going to feel a void yeah. you know you just feel like there's no purpose no rhyme no reason you know and so for us uh, it was r unquestionably the right thing that that we needed at that time to not just make a contribution but I think to call us to a, to a higher game. Mm -hmm. She's forced us to have to go to places that we needed to go to, to, to be better servants of life's opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, without without a question, there's no no question. Yeah. I'm sure you've learned so much from her. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from her? Two 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 things. Can I have two? You could have as many as you like. You know, number one is that she's amazingly resilient. Yeah, meaning that. You know, you think you've got a bad, I, I swear, everybody on this call, your worst moment was her life mm. every second. Mm. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to live a day that she lived in certain circumstances. But yet, she's been able to find her way back. It's like, you know, you, you tear a spider web down, you go back and you rebuild it the next day. Right. That's what you got, right? Right, right. 
So sometimes that's about all we got. Yeah. So the other thing I learned is that your love can't conquer other people's challenges. That's between them and life. Hmm. You know, there's a certain battle. There's a certain thing that we all have to fight on our own. Yeah. That nobody can do for us. You know. Yeah. We can, we can at best do the best that we can, and we're all human. And everybody brings into this world something that is palpable in terms of a temperament or right. a disposition or a proclivity that you can't say was genetic. You can't say that it was learned. They were born with it. Right. Right. And if you look at life's um, different phases of development, everybody's kind of got to go through it, and they've got to fight their own battle. Yeah. You no, know? and you can come in with a hope. You can come in with a an intention, but at the end of the day, you know, people have got to fight their own battle. And there's only so much that we can do. Yeah, that's really powerful. I appreciate you sharing that, and it reminds me of one of the interviews you gave of uh, one of your mentors that gave you advice when you were 18. I remember you saying that. What advice did he he walk in and yeah. tell you? Yeah, yeah, I, I actually thought about that as a pivotal moment that I kind of went with the mercury poisoning. But yeah, I was having a bad day, you know, and uh, he said, would you like a helping hand? And I said, God, this guy, how does he know? You know, it's like if there's every day to ask me, today's the day. Right. And I said, yeah, man, yeah, today's the day. And he looked, he said, you sure you want a helping hand? Yeah. He said, well, if you want a helping hand, you got one at the end of each arm. He turned around, he walked out of the room. Yeah. It was the right thing. I knew it and he knew it. He couldn't save me. It's like I had to fight the battle myself right. yeah. to, to learn that I had what it took to be able to engage life's challenges. And he wasn't going to interfere with that. Right. He did the right thing. He walked away. Right. I knew it. So did he. Life pivotal moment, man. Yeah. Dr. Spencer, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This has been absolutely phenomenal, and everyone should check out drdrjeffspencer.com uh, for the Champions Blueprint. Right, well, thank you. So, now there's only one of us in all of creation, and we should never forget that. So thanks for the privilege and the opportunity to be yeah. able to share with the audience. Yeah. Thanks, now, Jeremy. Thank you. I appreciate it. You got it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand